webinar, Professor, Professor Judith Shandor from the Central European University uh, in Budapest. So Judith is a longtime collaborator and friend of the Helix Center. Um, she has had uh, <clears throat> a long and <clears throat> very varied career. She has uh, practiced, she passed the bar exam in Hungary and has practiced in law. She is also um, a professor in the Faculty of Political Science, Legal Studies and Gender Studies within CEU and also director of the Center for Ethics and Law and Biomedicine. Um, Judith has, in addition to her um, sort of uh, academic work, Judith has also been involved with considerable legislative uh, and policy making activities at the national and international level, uh, particularly on reproductive rights. And she's also served as former chair, um, sorry, <clears throat> chief of the bioethics section at UNESCO and been involved in a considerable number of European projects, uh, which is actually how I first met you some time ago on the Remedy project. Um, but to those of you who are familiar with the work of, of Helix, Judith and her team have also been involved with uh, the Tisch EU project and the EU Celex project in which uh, Helix team members were also involved. So today, uh, Judith's talk is going to be about uh, reproductive privacy and genetic privacy in the context of genome editing, which uh, promises to be a really interesting talk. And I think we will have plenty of questions at the end. So in the way that we normally proceed in these webinars is that Judith will deliver her talk, um, after which there will be a QA and a session, which uh, I will host. You, if you want to ask a question, you can either turn on your camera and raise your hand so I can see you, or if you prefer not to turn on your camera, you can also type a question in the chat and I will read it out um, for you to, to respond to if we have time. So without further ado, Judith, would you like to proceed? Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the generous invitation. And I'm so happy, at least uh, virtually, to meet uh, so many colleagues. And, uh, and I regret that I couldn't have a chat after the lecture with a coffee and, and to meet in person. Uh, uh, Donna Dickinson was our guest at uh, uh, the 25th anniversary. We celebrated at CU with a very nice lecture for which we still remember. And many of us, uh, we had close contacts. And I'm also special thanks for Radmila who joined us from Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I can see also uh, pins now is moving and, and so uh, welcome everyone. I. Um, would like uh, to speak uh, today on something uh, which I'm sure that you are all familiar with, but uh, maybe I will take an approach which is not so uh, standard approach to this question. My first uh, question, technical question, can you see my slide now? Okay, um, so I think that with uh, the technical possibilities, you're all familiar with the cutting edge new technology of genome editing. Many people claim that we reached the new phase of transforming human beings and even altering of our uh, uh, genetic uh, legacy or heritage. And there are many uh, standard approaches to genome editing. I will cite some legal sources. Actually, there are many of them which are concentrated on scientific, ethical, and uh, legal aspects of gene or genome editing. Uh, I think the main focus is still on safety and also on uh, a little bit on discrimination, social, ethical, legal uh, approach. And uh, this time I would like to uh, think about, and it's a slightly hypothetical uh, scenario, uh, on the, the privacy aspect of the genome. Uh, technology, genome editing technology. For instance, such questions I'm interested in, provided that this technology once will be safe and will be exercised, uh, on what ethical framework may parents decide on gene editing of their embryos? What is the relevance of genetic ties and the modified genetic ties? Is it or my better self, or is it something which I would like to provide for my child? And what we learned so far from genetics, I think, is teaches us to be a little bit cautious, and we have to have 
uh, delineation between, on uh, one hand, reproductive side, so that my attitudes towards my reproduction, and genetics, and also the best interest of the child. The story starts uh, with a well-known event from 2003, when the completion of the Human Genome Project has been proudly announced. And I think that even uh, of the first draft was uh, announced earlier, two years earlier, but I think this is the time when not only scientists, but also the public, uh, also the uh, people who are having uh, issues of infertility, they started to think about how much they can rely on these new uh, knowledge, how much we can know about our genetic makeup or how much we can influence. It. And there are also two expressions which I would like to introduce. One is the so-called genetization, uh, uh, which of course, immediately when we try to speak on uh, genomics, we might uh, fell into the trap that we replace the psychological, physiological, pathological, uh, social conditions on uh, for genetic traits on expense of the environment, cultural, economic, and social explanations. And, and of course, uh, when the Human Genome Project has been uh, 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 announced, then there were such exaggerated uh, statements that we discovered the book of life and we shall know more about our genetic makeup. In immediately, of course, the critical side, especially bioethicists, took a critical stand and they um, uh, genetization also appeared as a different term as genetization. They, uh, it goes even uh, back to the 1990s when they uh, started to refer of uh, the increasing tendency to define differences between individuals uh, based on genetic traits. And I think this this kind of thinking is, um, is very relevant when we're speaking about the intersection of reproduction on one hand and genetics on the other side, and of course, uh, genome editing, which can be of a, a technology when both of these thinking are relevant. Um, Sheila Jezenov also very elegantly introduced another term uh, which is more on the textuality on uh, the uh, genomics. And it goes back, of course, to the ACTG uh, coding of the human uh, genome. And uh, lawyers used to say very proudly that uh, if you compare of thousands of years of literacy, legal literacy of legal textuality, uh, genomic uh, textuality is a relatively recent phenomenon. But of course, this is also just a symbol, but I mentioned this a symbol of textuality because I think it directly leads to the, this technology of genome editing, because editing in comparisons of the previous terms, what were the previous terms which we mentioned in this context in genetics, genome, genetic modification, manipulation, they had all of a kind of pejorative uh, connotation by editing is, you know, when you write a text, you are already ready and just give to the editor who is making a final touch and doesn't seem to be of a significant difference. Uh, and um, so I think that what is, it's a deliberate alteration of a selected DNA sequence, but what is very important that it doesn't bring some new foreign uh, DNA, but it's actually fixing of uh, what can be considered of a, a straight uh, strand, which uh, had a, a kind of uh, susceptibility to develop certain conditions. So the strand of DNA is cut at a specific point and naturally uh, existing cellular repair mechanisms are uh, implemented. So it's actually not a, a, a modification, but it's rather a correction. And, um, and uh, what, what is very important, and I think some of the international documents, especially in the beginning, didn't make this clear cut distinction that unlikely the genetically modified uh, technologies here, it, uh, when the outcome is something which does not appear in nature, 
here uh, the outcome is which uh, occurs uh, naturally. So this is, uh, I am sure that in these circles, I don't have to go to details of the technology, the CRISPR and the even more recent technologies, but it's just very briefly, what is the problematics from the genetic side? But I would like to introduce the legal uh, side or the philosophical side, which I uh, would like to bring closer to this topic. This is the notion of privacy, which is etymologically comes from uh, uh, deprived or withdrawn from public life, uh, deprived of office, this is the uh, privatus, or in comparing with uh, publicus, which is adult male populations, that was the, the reference to the public life. Of course, that has an interesting gender connotation. Uh, and there are many definitions, unlikely uh, genome editing, which uh, is, is a technical term. Privacy is a very complex uh, legal philosophical uh, notion, uh, but the core of this uh, notion, uh, referring to Alan Westin, is the claim of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent they would like to share information about them. So in a way, it's a kind of controlling uh, themselves, controlling their identity. Of course, now uh, lawyers are going further and uh, they, uh, they just similarly like property rights, there is a kind of bundle of different components of right to privacy or privacy. Uh, which depends on, on different jurisdictions, had different components. One is, uh, of course, uh, it's very relevant in the present debate in US on abortion, for instance, uh, the liberty interest to decide what would like to do with my uh, body, uh, to decide about uh, your partner, whom you would like to marry, how many children you would like to have specific relationship, mother-child bone. This is also relevant in uh, genetics, also uh, decisions about of, uh, whether you'd like to have a genetically related child or you would like to adopt the child or, and to protect the specific relationship, the, uh, the child whom you adopted or the child uh, uh, who is born as a result of the IVF. Um, not so relevant in this context, but I have to mention uh, when uh, privacy rights protect particular places. It was uh, the early US telephone tapping case, which were very relevant in developing the notion of right to privacy. Specific places, private house, for instance, bedroom are protected uh, as places uh, as a kind of scope of privacy. And information of privacy is again very relevant in case of uh, genetic privacy and reproductive privacy. What would like to communicate about yourself, uh, control of personal information, including genetic information. And I think we shall speak about that. Uh, what are the specific issues of controlling of genetic information? Um, uh, because of course you need a special expertise. Uh, you, you cannot read your um, genetic uh, uh, test results in the same way as uh, other uh, medical tests. You need some consultations and also there are some uh, specific uh, uh, consequences of that. Um, there are So if you're looking at the some differences in the reproductive sphere, then a relational aspect of privacy is very relevant of, of a husband, wife, the partners, a mother, child, father, child, bond uh, in a certain way of uh, the donors in, uh, and uh, the couple uh, who would like to procreate. So this is a very special uh, aspect of uh, privacy, which is relevant in case of reproduction and of course the bodily aspects. I can decide what to do with my body, what kind of medical interventions I would consent to and which one I would like to um, decline. Uh, genetic privacy, which is uh, often contested terms and first appeared more in the context of data protection and protection of uh, the, uh, genetic information against employers and insurance uh, context. Uh, it's, a, it's a broad uh, term as well. It's also encompassing of uh, uh, certain elements of, of liberty, also relations, 
uh, and I, I, I think there are a couple of new cases which are showing a new directions how genetic ties are protected or not protected, especially in the case of uh, assisted uh, reproduction. Information about my genetic makeup, whether uh, I, I need certain information or I can decline uh, uh, right not to know, for instance, it's a specific right which is mentioned in the context of genomics and bodily rights. So uh, genetic privacy is a new uh, uh, field, which is, of course, uh, uh, we will go into some details on how it has been uh, the, developed and what are the specific uh, um, issues in the context of genome editing. Um, some people criticize uh, privacy. Um, I don't want to say the economic analysis of law, Posner, several others, that it's, it's a kind of uh, secrecy which would like to hide of uh, information which is inconvenient to us, or it should not be mixed up with individualism, which is often mentioned in this context. I'm just mentioned here one citation that uh, when it's abstractions, when too much thinking about individual and forget about the community or ancestors or uh, uh, descendants. Reproductive privacy is a much older uh, phenomenon, and but it has been um, uh, shaped uh, due to new technologies, cutting act uh, reproductive technologies. Of course, it started with uh, a right to choose a partner, uh, access to contraception, abortion, uh, issues of infertility treatment, IVF, and there are some cases which are moving a little bit of in between of uh, genetic privacy, uh, for instance, uh, pre-implantation uh, genetic diagnosis. So the human body is, of course, of, uh, an, an issue which uh, very much connected to reproductive uh, privacy and there has specific gender aspects because most of the treatments are taking place uh, in, uh, in a women's body, also prenatal uh, diagnosis and prenatal treatments as well. Um, um, but if you think about reproduction as not just as a process, as a, as a technology, there are significant literature about especially before uh, how technologies were seen, what is parenthood, uh, how ethics is uh, looking at parenthood. And there is one element which is very interesting. It is, uh, can be seen as openness to unbidden. Uh, for centuries, people didn't know about the sex of the uh, fetus, about the medical conditions, uh, predisposition of certain illnesses. So in a way, it's an acceptance. You may not know of, uh, of your child's condition and even uh, the sex and most international documents even forbid to uh, uh, determine of uh, the sex or, or changing or uh, deciding on, uh, on abortion based on that fact, unless it's uh, related to a genetic condition. Uh, and the uh, acceptance is children more as a gift rather than product. But I think that, and, and of course, uh, human rights also uh, uh, reaffirming equal dignity of the individual. Uh, uh, and I think that with assisted reproduction and with the increasing number of uh, uh, genetic tests implemented in the uh, uh, in conjunction with assisted reproductions, there's a new line of thinking have appeared when it's not so much open to the unbidden, but there are uh, more and more the rights to have a, access to certain tests have been acknowledged. And of course, the uh, science fiction, the art and the literature uh, has recognized this uh, desire for a long time and uh, just I'm showing some movies and pieces of literature which are uh, speaking about it for instance the womb in which uh, uh, the motivation for uh, reproduction in together with cloning was uh, to have a child uh, as a substitution of a partner who died as a result of an accident and of course uh, despite of the resemblance uh, she had to understand that this is an independent life. Uh, her son is not her partner. Uh, she was carrying to term of the baby, which was uh, uh, cloned. Of course, all of them are uh, hypothetical fiction scenarios. Uh, 
And there are also not just as a kind of compensation for the losses, but in other pieces of literature for direct medical benefit. The reproduction is serving a direct medical benefit. And the other, um, also, I, I think it's the most recent, it's, it's uh, in a series uh, uh, when a serious violation occurs of the uh, privacy rights and even uh, bodily integrity when a doctor is using uh, his own sperm and uh, children are, a uh, huge number of children are born as a result of such a uh, intervention. This is already showing that the technology uh, as, as fantasies and also some cases the reality is uh, trying to recognize that the parents' desire to have a child is not such an unqualified desire, but it appeared of, of uh, having some interest to new technologies, especially when the family had, uh, of course, a predisposition in the uh, family. If you think about the Costa and Pavan case, for instance, in the European Court of Human Rights, it's evident that sometimes the parents had a very strong interest to avoid of a genetic uh, a condition which appears in the family when pre-implantation genetic testing can already um, uh, help them in that context. So let's see now genetic privacy. You just see that from reproductive privacy, we can get very close to genetic privacy. Here is, of course, there is a, a literature already one of the most well-known is Graham Laurie's book on uh, genetic privacy. And I, when I started to deal with um, genetics, we also looked at the genetic data from this context on how much can I um, decide what should be done with my uh, genetic data in a biobanks, in a what, uh, what are the interests of insurance companies to know about my genetic data and also in the context of employment. Several international documents are uh, focusing on it. I'm just mentioned one on the additional protocol to the Oviedo Convention, which is uh, focusing on the genetic testing and it's emphasizing, which is the whole Oviedo framework is very much based on the primacy of the uh, human being and saying that uh, the genetic test uh, uh, shall prevail over the sole interest of science and even society. If you look at the uh, jurisdictions of more uh, recent uh, cases, we can see some other interesting um, uh, approach to genetic data. One is genetic affinity, uh, which appeared in uh, the Singapore Court of Appeal in 2017 uh, in a ruling uh, when um, the uh, couple who underwent to the IVF treatment later on, they discovered that the gamete has been mixed up and their uh, baby uh, was not related to the husband uh, because in the clinic they mixed up the uh, gametes. Actually, uh, when I studied this issue, I was very much surprised how many such cases exist in different countries, and uh, many of them result in uh, uh, legal disputes. And then uh, it was very difficult to say what is this legal interest, because the child was healthy, infertile, couple got a treatment, but nevertheless they claimed and even though the child's interest is, is difficult to assess in that case, but definitely the couple who wanted to have a child together, they didn't manage because of the negligence of the clinic. And there are arguments in favor and against of a genetic affinity. For instance, if the parents sue the clinic, the child might be considered that, uh, uh, that as a kind of wrongful uh, uh, product that something is mixing because of mixing of the gametes, whether what is the uh, implications for the uh, future of the child's uh, life because of such claims. And uh, but so I we should make a distinction between genetic affinity and uh, genetic uh, identity. Uh, because genetic identity has been recognized even earlier on when uh, children claim uh, that they have a right to know of who were their biological parents. In many countries, they recognize that even the donor's uh, identity could be uh, revealed in front of children. So that is also showing of a tendency that we have a, a complexity of different uh, privacy rights in the field of uh, new uh, genetic interventions.
Um, the other uh, privacy related rights in the field of uh, genomics is the so-called uh, genetic transparency, which is an increasingly uh, discussed phenomenon as um, scientists were contemplating in some places what uh, happens if they are capable of affording the whole genome sequencing at the time of birth, for instance, to give it as a kind of uh, 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 test for uh, children, what can we do about it, and of course what uh, happens if the child's uh, already transparent in a, uh, from genetic perspectives at the moment of uh, birth. Uh, of course, early diagnosis always brings the possibility of early treatment, but therapeutic benefits are not always clear to the child, and of course it can uh, it's very difficult to deal with the information when it has been uh, disclosed, how children should be notified later, at what age, uh, whether they have a right not to know, and uh, whether discrimination uh, can occur. And here I would like to make of a side note, when I worked at the UNESCO, uh, once we had a delegation from uh, Yakutsk, uh, and uh, uh, in Yakutsk, because uh, there was also kind of a, uh, like a second gulag, several uh, prisoners were there and uh, because there were a lot of uh, marriages among people, um, there are uh, certain genetic uh, conditions uh, were much higher uh, than elsewhere and they uh, wanted to offer testing for the families, but the uh, geneticians were very much concerned about when they see that families, especially uh, poorer families, they were very much uh, like to have a test in order to maximize the benefits for the child who was not in, in, uh, in, uh, not affected by this condition. In other words, genetic discrimination could occur also within the family when the parents would like to give good education, better chances for the child whom they consider would have a better chances for a healthier life. And of course, it's just accelerating the differences in genetics. And then after we explored a little bit of the uh, reproductive privacy on one hand and genetic privacy on the other hand, uh, then I think the event which uh, uh, was dramatic for the whole world, uh, which happened in uh, 2018 in the second uh, human genome uh, editing summit, uh, when he, uh, Gianku, announced that uh, the uh, first uh, uh, twins who were uh, born as a, after the genome editing um, were born and uh, and he expected a big scientific success but as we know that instead of uh, uploading it was a very uh, chilly uh, uh, response because uh, first of all people didn't understand why uh, creating uh, children uh, due to these technologies uh, in order uh, to be resistant to HIV uh, virus, whether it is a, a legitimate purpose for such an experimental intervention, which is not yet safe and it uh, was not transparent and uh, ethical approval uh, was not uh, uh, adequately achieved. There was some consent form, but it was not uh, clear how this procedure was uh, monitored and approved by ethics committee. Uh, since then, of course, a lot of uh, normative anchors developed and, and uh, we are very much focusing on uh, what are the repercussions of such an experiment. And we could see that the legal framework uh, um, used the traditional um, uh, framework and distinctions, for instance, between somatic and germline intervention. It has been known already uh, since uh, uh, genetic interventions have been um, made, and so it's not specific for gene editing or difference between therapy and enhancement or in vitro and in vivo application of technology, what appears in nature and what does not appear in nature, what is single genetic disorder and whether polygenic uh, conditions can be used. And of course, we had a risk assessment. This is also more or less new. We try to see whether it's grievous, mild, what are the probabilities of uh, certain consequences, and there is a, a legal analysis, but uh, I think it's uh, striking that, uh, although it's a very new technology, but we try to use very 
um, traditional approach uh, uh, to tackle the issues. Uh, first of all, because after the uh, moratorium, which was announced, it was quite unexpected that such an announcement will be made. Uh, Declaration of Helsinki allows into some uh, cases and interventions uh, uh, when um, there is a kind of hope for saving life, uh, but of course in this case of uh, resistance is not a, a, a specific and not adequate reasons for making such an experimental uh, intervention. And they tried, uh, of course, the global uh, moratorium uh, and uh, the Oviedo Convention, which I, I referred many times, is uh, uh, had again a very old formulation, it was back to 1997, which is not specific to the genome editing, but it's about the modification of the human genome. And in the beginning, I mentioned that there is a difference between what appears in the nature, which is editing, and what is uh, actually uh, altering. Uh, modifying the human uh, genome, but nevertheless, it, to a certain extent, it can uh, be interpreted also in the context of uh, genome editing. Um, I think the for case of new technologies and assessment for uh, such a specific uh, connections between reproduction and genetics, even if it's hypothetical in, in at the moment in, when we're speaking about the using for um, uh, embryology and for uh, human reproduction. But I think one of the uh, answers can be seen in the so-called responsible uh, research. And it was a very particular that uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, they called for international community. They are the uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for the CRISPR-Cas uh, technique, and they uh, they were very responsible in a way, especially Jennifer Dudna many times said that she felt a, a huge responsibility for uh, applying these new technologies and called for uh, also social scientists to be involved in the uh, debate on how to apply this uh, technology. And several other professional organizations had reports, NAPEL Council, uh, Council also had uh, uh, several of uh, statements and uh, very good uh, uh, report on that, and WHO has also an expert advisory commission uh, which uh, tackled the human genome editing. Uh, when we're speaking about uh, rights of the parents, uh, and of course we have to think about what do we talk about? Is it about the request of the parents to make sure, like in a Costa and Pavan case, that the child will not be born with cystic fibrosis, or it's an enhancement? Of course, the we could see because of there are problems with the uh, transparency in a uh, genome editing. It, it, it's not so easy to draw the line between of the therapy and enhancement. And as we know more about of uh, uh, certain uh, conditions um, and able to um, identify them, of course, the question will be more and more relevant. And also, what stage um, these uh, decisions should be made um, in case of the in vitro embryo or uh, features, and uh, uh, what, uh, whether multiple changes are allowed in the same time, or uh, we're speaking about of the uh, focusing on one very specific uh, target. So uh, just to uh, going to the towards the conclusion, because I'm very much interested in your reactions. It is a very broad topic. I'm f uh, I am aware of. So these are just rather uh, introductory points. I think the privacy rights in a, in hypothetical in this hypothetical uh, case uh, in the gene editing child, uh, if the gene editing will be done, and in the case of the twins, for instance, uh, their privacy rights has been already compromised because, of course, their uh, genomic uh, genetics has been studied already, and in order to make sure that the procedure was successful, they have to be subjected to follow-up procedures. We don't know even how long, and uh, someone else made a decision about of their uh, genetic components, in this case, not the parents, but the, the doctor, uh, who decides about who will be uh, uh, corrected to what extent uh, further checkups has to be done. And in case of uh, the parents, uh, 
do we speaking about of the enhanced genetic ties or do I have a right via reproductive technologies to make sure that I will give the uh, of a kind of enhanced uh, uh, genetic ties or, or I, I would, this is just within the reproductive uh, choices that I, how does it shape of uh, identity? We know some cases of uh, gametes mixed up and embryo mixed up that there was an issue of race in uh, decisions, which I, I think that it was very uh, problematic that someone interfered because they wanted to sure that uh, uh, children uh, will be white, those who were born as a result of the assisted uh, reproduction. Um, so the conclusions on the genome editing, I think, opened a new chapter to a certain extent hypothetical, but to a certain extent is a very real new chapter in the history of the textuality of genetics, which helps us to rethink about of our genetics. It's also reinforced the influence of uh, how humans influence the uh, nature or impact on the nature, but it also, and that's uh, my presentation, wanted to focus on how it increased uh, parental choices and responsibilities, how this changed the original ethical framework of parenthood as open to unbidden, uh, which started to be questioned that, uh, that parents have certain conditions, that they have certain demands and requests, and they, they want to, to um, in, involved in the procedure. It's, it's uh, relevant in assisted reproduction with the combination of some uh, genetic technologies. But the delineation between of the parental uh, responsibility and reproductive self-expression is blurred. So it's very difficult to tell that it's how much for the parents would like to have a, of a kind of enhanced uh, reproductive and genetic line or how much it is of the uh, therapeutic uh, value. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very much looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Europe. That was great. I'm sure we will have lots of questions. So, uh, oh, okay, yes, I'm ha happy to throw the floor open. Just a very quick reminder to either raise hands or to type into the chat. So, uh, Donna, you, you were first. So if you would like to go ahead. Uh, yeah, if you can just unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Judith, that was a wonderfully wide ranging, comprehensive lecture, which I think we all enjoyed very much. So thank you for that. Um, I'm actually going to be a bit critical about the notion of privacy, because I think it's something of a weak read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we think of what is just happening in the US at the moment, with the possible overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, there has been dissatisfaction with the use of the reliance on privacy in Roe. And I think it is not the strongest argument that could have been made in the common law. There are many others, such as fetal personality or lack thereof, um, or equal, it's a 14th Amendment right in any case, so why choose privacy over others? Equal protection might have been a better one. Um, so I'm just thinking that practically, privacy from a sort of jurisprudential viewpoint may not be the strongest argument. And the other problem with it from a more theoretical viewpoint, and it's one that I'm interested in because I've been doing some work with some Native American geneticists um, who are very skeptical of the rather individualistic slant of privacy. And in particular, uh, in the wake of the uh, California case in which the Golden State murders, uh, in which the murderer was tracked down by a genetic test, DTI test, uh, taken by a third cousin. When you consider the position for indigenous peoples, it may well be likely that you could track, um, you know, it, that's a forensic case, but that you could track genetic links in a population which has quite close genetic links in a similar fashion. So this is one reason why many indigenous geneticists, such as the ones I've been working with, are skeptical. I'm opening up, I, I realize I've raised quite a number of issues and I hope I haven't thrown too much at you. 
but I think it's it's good if we open up quite a lot of issues at the beginning. Uh, can I respond now, or sh uh, what? How should yes, no. I, I, yeah, please, please do respond. Yeah. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for your observation. I just wanted to say that I fully agree with you. And in case of abortion, I do not argue with privacy, but um, discrimination. It was often misunderstood uh, because people try to think about this uh, either pro-choice or pro-life. And I, I, I also the privacy is a is a challenged notion and I, I, I also think that the Roe v. Wade is often misunderstood because it just wanted to say what was the scope of what was the possibility for the state to regulate abortion in three different trimesters of uh, in the course of pregnancy and they immediately it did, does not promote abortion does, uh, and I, I I fully agree with you but I maybe I was not strong enough in my uh, disclaimer in the beginning of presentation. I wanted to say that uh, this time I would like to approach uh, genome editing and uh, reproductive and genetic uh, privacy in, in an unusual way, because I also agree that the major issue here is discrimination, who would access to these uh, technologies, also, uh, uh, what is the impact of, uh, of uh, people are selecting certain traits, commodification during reproduction and many issues. But I, because uh, I, I think in the case of genome editing, I like abortion, privacy was not so much mentioned. Other uh, uh, framework was stronger. And I wanted to introduce the privacy framework here, which is an unusual addition in this context. So they, no one thinks about what's happening with the genome edited children. They are subject of multiple tests. They have to follow up their condition. They, whatever they do, their genetic makeup is an open book already studied at the moment of birth. So I thought that it's, a, it's an unusual uh, approach to add privacy here, but I fully agree with you that there are many problems uh, with the privacy, it's very contextual. It can uh, also be, um, uh, in, in the case of reproduction, it has uh, very serious limitations, I agree. And I actually, for women's rights perspectives, it's not a best uh, tool to argue uh, in, in this context. So um, maybe I was not strong enough to say in the, in the beginning that normally I approach it from equal protection size of commodification. But this time I wanted to put privacy here on the table because I think that in case of genome editing, this was not discussed. It was so much discussed in the insurance context, my genetic data, but not so much in, in especially how reproduction uh, is already negotiated and, and discussed uh, in a prenatal pre-implantation phase and we didn't think about the repercussions later on uh, for, for the offspring. But so thank you very much because your observation gave me a possibility to make it clear, which I, maybe I was not clear uh, enough in the beginning. And I fully agree with you that uh, privacy is here is a very uh, challenging and, and a concept which may not be the, the best tool to capture the issues of reproduction and the current Roe v. Wade. Uh, debate. I'm also looking at it with worries. Hi, Jane. I just seen you. Hi. Thanks, Judith. So um, <clears throat> I I'm going to read out a quick question in the chat uh, from Pedro, and then I will move to a question from Pins. So because I think so, Pedro says genome editing requires a special kind of informed consent in every case. Is, is that correct? Is there anything you want to, you could say about that and how that might relate to your main topic? I, in the particular case, it was uh, unfortunately uh, forms about how the photos will be made after the birth, but it did not specify the procedures. And I think in case of every new procedure, I haven't seen the consent form of uh, Louis Brown's parents. So many times I think when there is a new procedure that it's a little bit 
opaque and they didn't explain. They should be, of course. It's a general, and, and in case of new procedure, it has to be also clear that it's an experimental procedure. Sometimes people who are the pioneers uh, of these new procedure, they are not aware that they are the first. And uh, there was a consent form, as far as I know, in the Hichiankui case, but it was somehow not proportional. They put more emphasis on uh, the use of the photos, for instance, and how it will be communicated, secrecy, confidentiality, so the parents may not have the good impression on how uh, experimental this procedure was and whether the uh, creating HIV resistant children are really a good reason for such a intervention. But as a general rule, I think informed consent in this case is a general rule. Moreover, in case of new technologies should go uh, before the uh, ethics assessment, ethics review, and ethics review should also looking at whether the consent form correspond with the actual nature of uh, the procedure. This is uh, often also overlooked. So one thing that the assessment is looking at, the, but they have to be very careful to see whether the consent form, which uh, is uh, placed in front of the parents, for instance, is reflecting all the uh, challenges and uh, all the uh, risks which are involved in the procedure. Thank you. So Thank you. I, oh, sorry. I think Pins had a... Uh, Yes. So, uh, Pins, do you want to? Yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Thank you so much, Professor Shando. It's always a pleasure to to hear from you. And uh, it, it's not so much. Well, it's more like a, uh, what your opinion is about this. More on the basis of whether or not privacy could be used as a concept uh, to sort of become an unfettered sort of uh, parental autonomy and parental reproductive expression. And then correlating to uh, some ideas, some ideas that we should have moral obligations uh, to enhance our children in the same way that we treat diseases or you know, try to better ourselves. Uh, live longer, live better lives, cure cancer, that kind of thing. So I know there, there's no, no real answer to this, but what is your opinion on the boundaries between parental autonomy, privacy, and reproductive expression? Thank you. I think that uh, privacy is a precondition to autonomy. So if you don't have a information, necessary information to decide what to do, uh, because you didn't get the adequate information for the research teams, you cannot exercise your autonomy because autonomy is the best reflection of your uh, wish or what you want to do. But if you didn't get the full information or you got a distorted information, you didn't get access to all uh, necessary elements, you cannot exercise. So in this way, it's a precondition for parental autonomy. And he, the, here I just focused on this element of uh, privacy and you are right also similar to Donna it's a much broader issue there are. Uh, people are speaking of reproductive justice or also issues of. Uh, of uh, prenatal and pre implantation testing, uh, which I think it will go to that direction, as you say, maybe in a wrongful life wrongful birth cases will more and more include cases when there was a possibility of uh, genetic uh, testing and diagnosis and they, they requested actually we already had some cases there are an R versus Poland case, for instance. Uh, but it's it, you, normally it's in conjunction when abortion uh, access to abortion is limited and also they didn't get access to genetic uh, testing in and time. So you're right, it, it's parental uh, autonomy uh, may encompass also including the new technologies which are safe once it's safe and giving uh, opportunity to make sure that the uh, uh, child will be uh, uh, having of, of the best possible option and serves the best interest of the child, but privacy for me is the precondition for that, and uh, and also for later on for the child uh, um, uh, when he wants to make choices about health and education and other, it's also of a precondition. And uh, if it has been already compromised before the birth, of course, issues may come of 
uh, that someone else has been already decided on behalf of a child and it raises uh, very interesting legal and ethical questions. For me, it's a more a precondition. In this context, as you ask, it's a precondition to exercise parental autonomy. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions, not too many. So, Jean, I think you had your hand up first, and then Marco, I, I do see your hand as well. So, uh, Jean, yeah, if you would like to ask your question. Thank you. And uh... Thank you so much for a really, really stimulating um, talk. I, I just really liked it. And for me, you kind of are sort of really focusing on the the boundary between experiment and and a child. So, so I kind of um, understanding that, and and you described that uh, privacy is very contextual but moving between those boundaries and when, when, do, when do rights or, um, come into play? And so, so it seems to me as if you're using privacy as a way to unlock the rights of a child, but also put obligations on, uh, you know, kind of the, the people around the child. And so... I just wanted to sense check that with you, but also then to say, um, well, if you talked about using contract, are there other procedural mechanisms that we might bring into play um, to protect the privacy rights um, of, of this, this child that has um, come into being through experiment? Um, thank you very much. Also, a very good question. Of course, uh, uh, focusing on uh, privacy, I, uh, I was arguing based on the scenario, hypothetical scenario, this is safe already. So we actually confronted yeah. with these choices. At the moment, we are not. Those who made it, and unfortunately, later on, the uh, international scientific community condemned these uh, early approaches, but we may confront in the future. And then I wanted to uh, focus that what we assume that it's one box, something on of, of privacy related to reproduction, actually are two boxes. Uh, this is of... Uh, the genetic interest of uh, the parents might be uh, different than uh, the child's interest. And it's crazy, clear in the genetic affinity uh, issues of uh, mixing up gametes already. And I think it will be very difficult to address this issue. We know that how difficult are the wrongful life and birth cases already. But can you imagine if uh, it's a wrongful genetic uh, birth cases uh, will uh, create some tension between the choice made by the parents, the doctor's team, and uh, how the uh, child is confronted, already made choices before uh, her birth. It's clear when it's, it's a medical condition, I think more or less, but there are some other uh, issues here, or for instance, when there is a polygenic testing is already made, which is not so clear. Uh, uh, what is the uh, benefit of the child, especially some conditions when there is no therapeutic uh, uh, benefit of that. So I, I think that it should have other mechanisms, you're right, because the privacy is a very broad term. I, here I just wanted to show that even within this box, there are contradictions between of, uh, of the parents' uh, interest of my better self to create or making sure that even if there are some preconditions in my family, I have this genetic line, uh, line which I can reestablish in the best possible way. And the, the child's interest that, you know, it's my life, my identity. I, un I would like to unfold and open my genetic box and to do what to do uh, with it. Uh, so I think that uh, I, I believe that in reproductive clinics uh, should have... Um, such forms, I, what I've seen so far, are very technical forms, and they mm. should translate it in our in the language. Uh, first of all, to see not only the short-term consequences, but something in the longer one. So it should be of a con consultation and a multiple consultations, I think, and which should cover the whole procedure. That's my 
um, idea is always, it's not good to think about it uh, as what is the next step and I give a consent for the next step, but I don't see that this step is already involved uh, limited choices for the uh, further course of reproduction and the genetic choices. And I know that uh, it's not a way of uh, uh, scientists think because that is a slightly different uh, approach when the parents and uh, it's also difficult to uh, explain for the parents that uh, they should separate in themselves what is their um, choice or their preferred choice and what is since they are the representative of the best interest of the child it might be also of a of a different choice and and to be acknowledging these differences it's it's very complicated procedure i i will think about how to do it because uh, i i think there should be a better mechanism than a simple sheet of paper of a consent mm -hmm. and to to sign at the bottom uh, and using very technical language uh, sometimes even initials of the uh, or acronyms of these pr procedures mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. For the question. I will think yeah, about no, it. very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. So, Edith, are you happy to take one more question from Mirko? I'm very happy. Or, or she can answer tomorrow when we meet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I hope to join you all soon. Uh, the visa is still being in the process, and I still don't have quite uh, uh, information to share about it, but I, I hope it's going to be done soon. Um, thank you, Professor Shander, um, for yet again uh, opening new new box of discussions for us and maybe tickling our minds how to think about uh, stuff that we usually wouldn't maybe consider. But what I was thinking while you were talking about uh, right to privacy and autonomy, it's sort of like a question of what was first, chicken or the egg? And what I mean by that in, in, in sense of consent form, it's one thing to have a consent form, but then there is this, I think, layer that we don't really discuss very often, and that's the trust. And not only the trust in, in, in uh, the doctors, but the trust in technology. And this comes from this argument that we don't really have good or bad genes. If you discuss with scientists, they are just genes. It is us who construe the mean, give them the meaning of good or bad in, in a long, long run. And this is where this argument of our moral obligation to uh, support or enhance the capabilities of, of our children also come to. So my question is, what would be then your, um, Answer, what com comes first, trust or consent? I think that the trust uh, should be gained in the procedure. Uh, I, of course, some people uh, who go to the uh, clinics, they already have some trust and openness to the technology, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But um, I think that uh, trust should be gained. I know some people who are given up, especially because of this broken trust. I, I visited uh, many, many clinics in different countries when, because I wanted to see the protocol. I see some places when they have very nice illustrations, uh, they have a special room uh, to discuss the, uh, with couples or people who go to the clinics. And uh, this, of course, uh, th there is a huge literature about what is the role of trust in medical procedures. That's e even ordinary medical procedure, not to mention of the um, cutting edge new technologies. This is a very important um, concept. And uh, consent is also giving of a kind of indication. Uh, this is of a, um, they also mentioned as a moral miracle, which will help to open this um, trust relationship because on one hand the doctor is disclosing openly and I think it's good when it's um, it's proportional information and it's also not only the good elements of um, disclosed but it's also of uh, potential risk and outcome and there is a question and comment section it's not only of a, in one direction uh, uh, how the information is provided. It's often forgotten and some people believe in a miracle formulation that's one sheet of paper and everything is there. It never works like that. 
in especially in case of assisted reproduction in conjunction with uh, genetic testing. So trust is an important element. Thanks, Edith. That was that was great. So I think uh, nothing really remains for us to do except for everyone to thank you for a fantastic talk. So uh, if everyone would show their appreciation. Thank you very much for being with me. I was very happy to see you all. It's a pity that we can't be in the same room together. Next time. Next, Next time. time. Next Thank time. you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.